Hello, and thank you for joining us for this exclusive webinar on new requirements for electrical equipment, why materials matter. A host of new and future regulations impact the design of today's electrical equipment. Tough energy efficiency requirements, for example, may render past design practices and technologies obsolete. In this presentation, you will learn how electrical system designers, in collaboration with material engineering specialists, are not only meeting, but anticipating future requirements for electrical design. Roger's talk will focus on emerging requirements for electrical equipment design, how material science benefits product performance, reliability, and manufacturability, new test methods for evaluating material solutions and system performance, and the benefits of a total system solution. Now I say we let Roger take this presentation over. Roger? Thank you, Gary. My presentation today is going to cover a range of topics. First, I will provide an overview of DuPont, and then I will briefly identify the broad range of DuPont materials used in the manufacturing of electrical equipment. Next, I will then discuss some of the new requirements that the designers of electrical equipment must address. Finally, the bulk of the presentation will be to describe the materials and system testing along with new product development to address these trends in the market. DuPont is a company driven by core values related to safety and health, environmental stewardship, and high ethical standards along with respect for people. With DuPont, the goal is zero. Many of our product offerings are driven by these values to allow DuPont to be the world's most dynamic science company. Our vision is to create sustainable solutions which are essential to a better, safer, and healthier life for people everywhere. DuPont meets this vision with a group of market-driven businesses targeted at meeting the requirements of each market using our science while maintaining our core values. Our products are used widely in agricultural, automotive, and industrial application. However, today's presentation will focus on electrical equipment used primarily in industrial and automotive applications. DuPont provides materials and systems to help extend the life of today's electrical equipment used in industrial and automotive applications. This paper will highlight some new requirements that electrical equipment designers must address and some of the changes in technical requirements for materials and testing of materials as a result of these trends. This presentation is not intended as a technical discourse on the specific technical threats that engineers have faced due to these changes, as there are many good papers that do just that. Rather, this paper describes how DuPont has collaborated with equipment manufacturers and other material suppliers to provide materials that help develop new insulation options as well as new test methods to address these emerging threats. Collaborative solutions to technical problems are necessary to facilitate timely development of answers to current and future industry requirements. For the last 50 years, DuPont has been a leader in the development of electrical insulation materials used in the manufacturing of electrical equipment, with many of the most well-known brands of materials being invented by DuPont. Nomex brand paper, Kapton polyimid film, Mylar polyester film, Teflon fluoropolymer resins and films. Additionally, there is a wide range of engineering polymers and resins which are DuPont materials used in the manufacture of electrical equipment, including Voltatex varnishes and resins, as well as Rhinite polyester and Zytel nylon engineering polymers. With this broad range of electrical insulation materials, DuPont materials are used in almost every type of electrical equipment. DuPont has developed expertise in the manufacturing, testing, and development of materials used for these applications as both individual materials and as components of integrated insulation systems. Such expertise is used both to assist our customers with products that help them produce electrical equipment with extended lifetime, as well as to allow DuPont to develop new materials to address the ever-changing requirements in the marketplace. What sets DuPont apart to help address these ever-changing requirements is the breadth and depth of DuPont expertise in this market, in part because of the breadth of offerings. 
Over the past few years, this has resulted in collaborative efforts by DuPont engineers from different businesses to solve technical issues that no one business likely could have solved on their own. There are a number of new requirements that designers of electrical equipment such as motors, generators, and transformers must address today. In some cases, these requirements are driven by regulations, such as improved energy efficiency, and in other cases, they are driven by advances in technology and related equipment, which affect the performance of adjacent equipment. As a manufacturer of electrical insulation, many of our customers come to us for assistance in helping them address these changes to make sure our materials, and hence their equipment, will be suitable for these applications. In some cases, these customers no longer have the testing capability in-house to conduct such evaluations. In other cases, with the change of technology, the equipment they used to address similar issues in the past no longer provide useful information to address these new requirements. For the rest of the presentation, I will provide examples of where DuPont has helped address the needs of changing requirements in areas such as inverter-driven motors, hybrid electric traction motors, and high-intensity discharge ballast transformers. Most of the technical evaluations that we conduct for our customers involve two key areas, energy efficiency and cost reduction. As you will see in my examples, energy efficient systems often cause increased voltage stress on electrical insulation in electrical equipment, but solutions must always be conducted in the most cost-effective manner that still provides a reliable technical solution. Most engineers can solve these challenges by brute force, but by applying some of the testing methods we have developed, the engineers can solve these problems in the most economic fashion. Motors are one of the largest users of electricity, and as such, the use of more efficient motors has long been one way of reducing the use of electricity. The ability of a DC motor to be operated at variable speeds enabled more efficient operation than AC motors. However, DC motors cannot be applied in all motor applications, and the maintenance of DC motors is more involved. As a result, the use of inverters became the method of allowing AC motors to be operated at variable speeds, capturing the benefit of variable speed operation without the cost of maintenance of DC motors. In the 80s, pulse width modulation was adopted as the preferred method to provide the AC output from the inverter. In the 90s, further efficiency improvements were made to the inverters by the introduction of fast switching IGBTs, insulated gate bipolar transistors. Initial enthusiasm for this new type of energy efficient motor was, however, met with the increase of motor failures versus AC motors operated with conventional motor controls. Investigation into the cause of failures identified overvoltage spikes caused by the use of the IGBTs in the inverter systems. These spikes were both at very high voltages versus the system voltage of the equipment and at very high frequencies. This dual threat changed the typical motor failure from a purely thermal failure to one caused by a short-term overvoltage. The industry has recognized the need to provide new test methods for addressing these problems. Tests have been set up to evaluate insulation materials and systems, to evaluate the effect of increased voltage levels on slot liner materials, magnet wire insulation, and combinations or systems including impregnating resins. To address the higher failure rates in this type of equipment, the IEC recently added periodic testing of corona inception levels for motorette testing of insulation systems designed for severe applications such as seen with inverter duty motors. DuPont has conducted such testing as part of its work with customers in this area. Early failure analysis of inverter duty motors showed magnet wire insulation to be an area of major concern and much of the early work was conducted in this area. Testing of improved magnet wire and motors containing them has been the source of many technical papers over the last 20 years. DuPont has a family of materials which are designed to assist the equipment designer in meeting this threat, including Kapton CR polyimid film, Voltatex VS wire enamel, and Type 418 Nomex mica paper. This variety of materials from one supplier provides the designer with flexibility to solve his design problems since often what can work in one application doesn't work in others. 
For example, for small round wire used in lower voltage equipment, a corona resistant wire enamel such as Voltatex VS is optimum due to the ease of enamel coating round wire. As wire sizes increase or become rectangular in shape, a wrapped solution such as Kapton CR or Type 418 Nomex Mica paper becomes a more attractive solution. DuPont engineers are working with equipment designers to help solve their design problems. For most inverter duty motors, small round enamel coated wire is used. In one specific case, an engineer was designing a low voltage motor for an application where the threat was an inverter which creates DVDT, which accelerates degradation of the wire enamel. We evaluated this threat using a 20 kilohertz pulse with a 50 nanosecond rise time. We conducted testing on a variety of corona resistant magnet wire insulation solutions and the best material was the Voltatex VS wire enamel. Voltatex VS provides corona protection by using nanotechnology at a polymer level rather than through the use of fillers. We additionally evaluated these insulation materials under AC sinusoidal voltages above the corona inception level and the Voltatex VS again outperformed other wire insulation under the conditions of test. In a separate case, the use of corona-resistant magnet wire did not completely eliminate premature failures. Material suppliers have evaluated improvements in the impregnating varnish, and more recently, DuPont has been working with customers to understand the improved slot liner materials. To provide a further increment of improved performance, we looked at what could be done to improve the slot liner to allow a more corona-resistant material, which would still meet the requirements of the application. Slot liners are designed to provide electrical insulation between the windings and the laminations of the motor stator. The main requirements of a slot liner are stiffness for automatic insertion, high tear strength to prevent mechanical puncture from the sharp edges of the stator lamination stacks, good dielectric properties depending on the voltage class of the motor, and finally, to be capable of handling the short and long-term thermal requirement of the motor design. Typically, this material is evaluated as part of an electrical insulation system, and for Class H motors, 180C, the insulation of choice is often NMN, two layers of Nomex paper sandwiched around a layer of polyester film, hence the name NMN. In this specific case, we decided to evaluate alternative slot liner materials to improve the overall life of the motors. There are two ways to make slot liners more resistant to the effect of the high voltage spikes in inverter duty motors. One way is to make the slot liners thicker, which has the effect of lowering the volts per mil stress across the slot liner to enable partial discharge free operation. For this very reason, a low voltage motor often has thinner slot liners than higher voltage motors. However, this is not always possible for motors with high fill factors for example, there's no room in the slot for the extra materials. In these cases, we must then consider the use of slot liner constructions that are more corona resistant. Mica based materials are used in high voltage motors specifically due to their ability to resist partial discharge. However, for slot liner applications, the use of mica must be balanced with a need to maintain high mechanical strength to protect the motor windings. Using sinusoidal voltage endurance testing, we first looked at a typical NMN laminate under a combination of corona and elevated temperatures. The testing was conducted at 360 Hz to increase the effect and obtain results in a shorter time. For the test condition selected, the NMN lasted around 20 hours. We then evaluated using our Type 418 mica containing aramid paper under the same test conditions and obtained a lifetime of 1,000 hours. The Type 418 paper has much better resistance to partial discharge due to the mica content. However, mica containing products tend to be quite weak mechanically. We next evaluated the life of a layered structure of Type 418 and our Type 410 paper under different voltage conditions to better understand incremental benefits of the addition of Type 418 into a potential laminate structure. This chart shows the results of the testing of layers of Type 410 and Type 418. Type 418 has very good voltage endurance, however, it is weak mechanically. So, to help provide an optimized solution, we proposed an NMN laminate where one of the two layers of Nomex paper would be replaced by Type 418 to incrementally improve the corona resistance of the slot liner to help improve the life of the motor. 
This testing proved that by substituting portions of the laminate with type 418 papers, we could improve the life of the laminate versus that of typical NMN laminates. We then worked with DuPont customers who already produced NMN laminates, and they produced a series of laminates where one layer of the NMN was replaced by type 418 paper as a finished commercial laminate. This chart shows the incremental improvement seen in these laminates. Commercial motors were then built with versions of these improved laminates, and the good news is that there have been no failures to date. The bad news is that there have been no failures to date, so we don't know how much better these motors are than motors insulated with other slot liner materials such as NMN for the same application. Testing of complete insulation systems was first developed in the late 50s and revised in the early 70s. The first standard test method developed was IEEE 117, IEEE Standard Test Procedure for Evaluation of Systems of Insulating Materials for Random Wound AC Electric Machinery. In this standard test, motorettes are built that model the important components of the motor, magnet wires, slot liners, etc., and enable a thermal evaluation of these materials to determine life characteristics. Cycles of thermal aging followed by cold shock, mechanical stress, moisture exposure, and then electrical proof tests simulate motor operation, and the failure of the proof test determine the life limits of the system. For motors whose primary failure was thermal, this proved to be a useful tool and has been broadly used for 50 years. However, as I mentioned earlier, there have been recent changes in insulation system testing to help address the new threats caused by the use of inverter systems in controlling low voltage motors for variable speed drives. One such test is IEC 60034-18-41, Qualification and Type Test for Type 1 Electrical Insulation Systems Used in Rotating Electrical Machines Fed from Voltage Converters. In this testing, an additional evaluation of the partial discharge inception voltage, PDIV, of the motorette is included to help understand how well the system can withstand these overvoltage phenomena. For one application in Asia, we conducted two sets of experiments. The first was to conduct motorette tests using this new IEC protocol with the following results. You can see in this chart that the Nomex-based solutions outperform the alternative materials used as slot liner materials. The ultimate reason to do all of this testing is to translate results to improvements in the final electrical equipment. With these positive results from the motorette testing, we then tested three different motor designs as complete motors using the same test protocol. In this test, one of the motors was a standard industrial motor, the second was a motor designed for inverter duty applications, and the third was a motor designed by an Asian motor manufacturer with the assistance of DuPont engineers. For this motor, DuPont proposed manufacturing the motor based completely on DuPont materials with Voltatex VS wire enamel, DuPont Voltatex impregnating resin, as well as an improved NMN laminate versus that used in the other two motors. In this test, both the standard motor and the DuPont design motor were insulated with NMN as slot liners, and they outperformed the inverter duty motor insulated with the other material as slot liner. The DuPont design motor also had a PDIV level of 40% higher than that of both the other motors, which would make it much more resistant to the voltage spikes seen in these applications. So, in a number of examples, DuPont has worked with motor designers using a combination of improved wire insulation and improved slot liner insulation to improve the life of their equipment. In one example, a complete DuPont insulation system proved to be the best technical solution. In a growing number of situations, this one DuPont approach has proven to be quite effective in solving customers' technical problems, and we are doing this with a technical resources supported in a global fashion. To move on to a different application, motors for hybrid electric vehicles are similar to other low voltage motors, but they differ in several aspects. There are a number of different approaches in use to design motors for this application, as designers balance power density, higher power output per unit weight, with manufacturing productivity, how automated the manufacturing process can be. 
In many cases, the increased power density has been achieved by manufacturing motors that are different from typical low voltage motors in a number of ways. One way to increase the power density is to improve the heat removal from the motor by using internal or external cooling. For internally cooled motors, fluids such as automatic transmission fluids are sprayed on the motor windings to remove the heat more efficiently. However, motor materials must then be evaluated for chemical compatibility versus these type of fluids, which are not used in typical low voltage motors. Classic testing of chemical compatibility involves testing of solids and liquids in a sealed tube test, where all of the materials in one tube are at elevated temperatures. This can yield very low life results if the fluids in the evaluation are tested at temperatures well above where they would be used in the equipment application. DuPont has previously developed a unique dual temperature testing method which allows testing of insulation materials at elevated temperatures while still controlling the bulk fluids at temperatures represented in the actual application. This method has been incorporated into an IEC standard, IEC 62332, Electrical Insulation Systems, Thermal Evaluation of Combined Liquid and Solid Components. DuPont worked with one key hybrid electric vehicle manufacturer using this dual temperature test and successfully helped them characterize their insulation materials used in their traction motors. More recently, we have been conducting additional testing to help other manufacturers understand options for their slot liner materials to use in these type of motors. In this more recent test, we evaluated a variety of motor materials for compatibility in an ATF fluid as is shown here. The material most commonly used in Class H motors, an NMN laminate, will not work in combination with the ATF as is shown in this figure. Industry standard tests such as the motorette testing previously described in the prior example would have shown good thermal evaluations for the HEV motors which typically operate at temperatures well below 180 C. However, it is this additional requirement of ATF compatibility that requires new materials and testing choices. DuPont has worked with several OEMs to help them understand other options to insulate their motors with the combination of thermal, stress, and chemical compatibility, as well as cost effectiveness in mind. Using a variety of laminated solutions from DuPont customers around the world in this single test, we demonstrated a relative performance of these options. Nomex paper has the best chemical compatibility of the materials tested, but it doesn't always meet the mechanical requirements for the motor manufacturer. For certain types of designs, the addition of a film in laminate form provides more stiffness and initial tear strength needed for the manufacturing process. However, the best technical solutions tend to not always be the optimum choice, with the exclusion of the cost-effective polyester film from the options for this application, credible technical data can be developed based on DuPont testing, which then helps the designers make the correct cost-benefit analysis. Finally, for a transformer application, we will discuss ballast transformers used for high-intensity discharge lamps. As recently as the late 80s, only a small percentage of lighting ballasts were electronic. With improvements in technology, combined with new energy efficiency standards from the U.S. Department of Energy, by the year 2010, most low wattage lighting fixtures have been moved from magnetic ballast to electronic ballast, which are much more energy efficient. For higher wattage industrial lighting applications, the use of electronic ballast is still not fully feasible. However, these applications still required more energy efficient designs, so manufacturers moved from probe start to pulse start ballast designs. The beauty of the pulse start ignition of the lamps is a significant reduction in the total energy used to start and operate the lamps. The downside of this type of design happens if the lamp has failed. When a lamp fails, the ballast tries to restart the lamp and a very high voltage pulse is then imposed on the ballast, much higher than the typical operating voltage. This overvoltage is now continuous for long periods of time rather than for very short duration. This caused a higher failure rate than seen with probe start ballast, and one manufacturer approached DuPont with a request to help solve this problem. For this design, we again looked at designing an insulation system which could withstand high levels of partial discharge at elevated temperatures. 
we worked with the ballast customer to design a voltage endurance test which was more severe than his worst case scenario from both a voltage standpoint and from a frequency. We used 360 hertz versus a normal 60 hertz operation. We then modified our testing to be similar to the actual pulse conditions of the igniter used to light the lamps and verify the relative improvements of different material options. A solution was developed which enabled the customer to reach their life requirement using an insulation barrier based on type 418 paper, which lasted 50 times longer than the, their standard barrier under our testing, which enabled them to meet their life requirements for a lamp out condition. Changes in technology and energy efficiency requirements have forced engineers to reevaluate the way they manufacture their electrical equipment. In many cases, the tools to do this evaluation either never existed at their company or these tools no longer are capable of providing timely answers. DuPont, with the breadth and depth of our product offering, have maintained and grown our capabilities to perform such evaluations, and we work with equipment designers and their material suppliers to provide materials or services that can help them design technical solutions to address these ever-changing requirements. All of this is possible because DuPont produces high-performance electrical insulation materials that provide equipment designers with the tools necessary to meet the emerging requirements. Thank you very much. Roger, thank you for your presentation. Now let's get to the questions and answers. We'll have about 20 minutes for questions. Again, if we don't get to your question, don't worry. We'll have an answer for you within 24 hours. The complete question and answer transcript, including answers we did not have time for, will be sent to all of our registered attendees and will be posted with the webinar when it goes to its on-demand mode. Now let's take a look at our first question. We have a question from the audience that asks, which ATF was used? since there are many ATFs in the market. Yeah, Gary, thank you for the question. Um, we've used a, a number of different ATF fluids, and they're very specific, uh, as the question refers to, from the, the different customers that we're doing the evaluation for. And uh, it's been a number of different ATF fluids. Another question from the audience asks, where can I get samples and purchase quantities later? Um, usually you can get the samples of our materials from uh, our distributors in the specific regions where you reside. Um, if, if you need the specific uh, information on who those people would be, we'll provide a link to that in the answers to these questions. Uh, another question from the audience asks, is it mean that a high voltage transformer 418 is better than 410? I think what it meant to say it is 418 better than 410 in high voltage transformers. The 418 is specifically designed for applications with higher volts per mil stresses, and uh, any material like 418 that is contains mica is much more capable of withstanding partial discharge. And so, yes, 418 will operate better under very high voltage conditions. Another question from the audience, Roger. In regards to the mechanical performance of these materials, what nanotechnology systems have been used to characterize performance? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. There are uh, a lot of people that are doing work with nanotechnology. Uh, DuPont has a couple different materials uh, where we use nanotechnology both for our uh, polyimid films and for our impregnating resins and a number of other manufacturers selling materials into this industry do as well. Okay, thank you, Roger. Question came in. We have a panel with wires and other electronic modules. Environment is 83 degrees C and 100% RH condensing. We need to perform thermal aging for a life of 40 years. So it didn't sound like he asked it in a question, but maybe he meant to say, do we need to do performing thermal aging? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question, Gary. Thanks for that question. Um, the real challenge you face with a uh, need for a 40-year life is that uh, it really needs to be a very long duration test. Uh, in liquid-filled transformer aging, 
we developed a standard recently where we need to extrapolate out to 180,000 hours, a little bit over 20 years. And really the most effective way to do that is to do a, a test that is going to be in the range of four to five years long. So um, I'd be glad to talk in more detail about uh, the type of test you would need for a 40-year life. Um, there's an IEEE 1, I believe, I can look it up, but IEEE 1, I believe, deals with how you would set up an experiment and, and extrapolate for long periods of time. Thank you, Roger. Another question. Where can we find a technical data sheet for type 418, and is it good for temperature class R, 220 degree C? Yeah, so again, um, I'll provide that link on uh, the answers to this uh, webinar. Our type 418 paper is a 220C rated material, and uh, the, the uh, data sheet for that product is on our website. Here's a question about, um, and I'm going to, it says, what's, what is it called for M&M with type 418? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure that anybody's come up with a commercial name, but the different manufacturers that we've worked with um, have been working hand-in-hand -hand with the equipment manufacturers who needed the 418 material. And um, I think they just call it NMN with 418. I'm not sure that they've come up with a, uh, a, a name similar to the NMN that is commercially, conventionally used in motor and transformer application. All righty. Another question has come in. Is having the insulation installed going to make the transformer more energy efficient? If the answer is yes, why? Uh, can you repeat that question for me? <laughs> sure. Is having the insulation installed going to make the transformer more energy efficient? And if the answer is yes, why? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So energy efficiency, or the, uh, how one would calculate energy efficiency, depends significantly on the loading of the piece of equipment. For example, energy losses are both no load and load losses. The larger uh, or the smaller, more compact a unit is, it will tend to have lower no load losses but if it's more compact, it usually means the equipment is running at a higher temperature. And so if fully loaded, it will incur higher load losses. So in many cases, it depends on the specific application. One could actually make a more efficient transformer by making it smaller if it's a transformer that's going to be lightly loaded. If it's a transformer that will be heavily loaded, on the other hand, it's likely to be more efficient by making a uh, larger piece of equipment. Thank you, Roger. Here's a question. How do you balance aging time with aging temperature so that you do not cross the thermal breakdown barrier or exceed thermal stress capabilities? Yeah, so that's a challenge, um, especially if one considers aging of combined materials. If you're looking at aging of uh, unique materials, I'll say, or separate materials like a Nomex paper or a polyester film, by themselves, you usually have an understanding of their thermal capability and you, uh, for example, when we aged Nomex paper, we aged Nomex paper at temperatures ranging from 260C to 320C to get a 220C rating. However, when you have co combinations of materials, for example, if I were to be aging Nomex with Mylar, NMN, Mylar uh, has a lower temperature capability, and polyesters tend to uh, melt at about 250C, so I wouldn't be able to age that combination at temperatures above 250 because then it would be an, it would be an unfair test. So one has to look at the combination of materials when, when you do kind of a thermal evaluation to make sure that you don't exceed the capability of, uh, of some of the key system components. Thank you, Roger. Here's another question. m and data sheet that we can, we can find it on our website, correct? And then the follow-up question is how flexible or, or what is the mechanical strength of 418 M&M and M&M? So um, data sheets for laminates, uh, there are some links to data sheets for laminates for the variety of uh, manufacturers who produce those laminates. And that's really the best place to get those data sheets. 
um, from testing that we've done as uh, in combination with this with customers for uh, these applications where we're using a 418 layer to improve the voltage endurance um, most of the mechanical strength in those materials come from the the film in the middle of the of the sandwich the uh, polyester film so we don't expect that the strength will be dramatically affected by replacing some of the Nomex paper with our 418 paper. Uh, hopefully that answers the question for you, Gary. Thank you. Here's another one. What is the environmental stability of Nomex materials, especially high temperature, humidity, and UV light resistance stability? Okay, so let's take those each at a time. So in terms of high temperature, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's a time temperature relationship. We age Nomex paper in temperatures from 260 to 320 C to enable us to get our rating of 220 C, which is good for 100,000 hours life. In terms of humidity, uh, we do a lot of evaluation of Nomex under humid conditions. Um, and typically our materials are very good in terms of their characteristics, even under high humidity conditions. Um, and that uh, information is available in our technical data sheet for, for example, our type 410 papers. In terms of UV resistance, um, most organic materials are not very good in terms of being able to withstand UV. Uh, again, when people ask me this question, I do have technical data that I can provide. So I will attach that information uh, as part of the answer to this question. Thank you, Roger. There's another question that's come in. Is there any information on life versus, and it looks like PD levels? Yeah, so again, that's kind of, uh, uh, in, in the presentation I mentioned where we did technical evaluation of different combinations. And um, I have a data sheet that addresses life versus uh, the voltage stress across materials for both, for example, our type 410 and type 418 papers. And that's accessible on our, our website, but again, I can provide a link to that uh, in the answers to this question. Thank you, Roger. A question has come in. How thin are the Nomex papers? They didn't particularly address a single type. Yeah, so the thinnest commercial uh, thicknesses of Nomex paper in the marketplace today are uh, one and a half mils thick. Um, the vast majority of the usage is in the range of two mils and above. Okay. Uh, question has come in. What is the shortest aging time that should be considered in order to achieve the equivalent of one IEEE life? Gee, that's an interesting question. Again, a lot of it depends on the uh, requirement that you're doing the aging for. Most of the IEEE test protocols were established based on 20,000 hour life and in such an evaluation we like the um, shortest time to be around 100 hours and the longest time to be around 5,000 hours. In the case of the uh, what I mentioned earlier where we're looking at 20 uh, year life uh, we're expecting the shortest time to be somewhere in the range of uh, 500 hours and the longest time to be about 5,000, but that's a fairly special con uh, condition that was, uh, shall we say, negotiated as part of the standard uh, for, for C57-100 that we recently completed. If I actually followed IEEE 1, it would have been more like uh, four or five years for the longest period of time and probably close to one year for the shortest. It's all about how accurately you want to be able to extrapolate data to give uh, good confidence of your life expectation. Uh, thank you, Roger. Uh, here's a question that uh, pertains to slide 19 on your presentation. What thicknesses of MNN and Nomex 418 were used on the example you presented? In that specific example, the NMN was, I believe, a 353, so 3 mils of Nomex, 5 mils of polyester film, and 3 mils of Nomex, as compared to a uh, 14 mil type 418 paper. Thank you. Here's a question. Are there formulations of Nomex which maintain their form after operations on a press break? Um, 
I, I'm not familiar with that application, so I'm not sure I could answer the question directly. I will say that Nomex paper is very strong mechanically and is used in a number of applications where mechanical strength is a key criteria. Uh, I have in my hand a, a piece of Nomex paper that was used as a um, uh, for mechanical purposes in a transformer that was removed from our service from our plant recently and this paper was installed in that transformer in 1965 and it feels brand new to me when I did a, uh, a technical evaluation on the paper it was essentially unaged after all that time uh, I've seen uh, use in some applications in uh, uh, a mechanical press for example uh, at uh, uh, a, a printing press where craft type papers were replaced with Nomex papers because the craft papers were wearing too quickly and so we replaced those and used Nomex paper instead and uh, dramatically increased the life of the or the amount of time between uh, uh, shutdowns where they had to replace the backing material not sure if those factors apply to the question but hopefully that will be some good information Thank you. And then here's a question that asks about the comparison between Kapton and Nomex. And it appears they're looking for if there's differences in the mechanical strength and maybe electrical properties. Yeah, so that's a good question too, Gary. So um, uh, films inherently have very high dielectric strength. The uh, Kapton polyimid film uh, probably is in the range at 1 mils of uh, six to 7,000 volts per mil. Um, Nomex paper, the, the highest dielectric strength Nomex paper type 410 is in the range of 8 to 900 volts per mil. So the films are very high density. They tend to have good initial dielectric strength, um, whereas Nomex still has very good dielectric strength, much higher than, for example, a similar thickness of craft paper. Um, on the end, the other attributes of films is that they have good typically on a thickness per thickness basis, good initial tear strength characteristics, whereas the, the advantage of a paper, a non-woven type thing with, good, with fibers to provide mechanical strength, is they still have reasonable initial tear strength, but they have really good what's called tear propagation strength. So if you nick it, it won't easily tear, whereas with films, if you nick them, they will be able to tear very easily. Roger, another one has come through. How is the chemical compatibility of type 418 MNN? Yeah, so the, the chemical compatibility of the 418 NMN, and let's say, let's say that this question is related to the ATF uh, example I gave earlier on, would unfortunately be no different than a normal NMN because all you've done by replacing the 418 with the 410 paper is improved the resistance to partial discharge but chemically the 418 is similar to the 410 but unfortunately the film is no different in that situation where the manufacturers have had to look at um, chemical compatibility in these motors that have ATF if that's the reason for the question um, a film that has higher chemical compatibility is what's been necessary uh, to be able to withstand the effects of things like the ATF Thank you, Roger. Here's a, another Kapton question. Uh, can Kapton tape be used with epoxy coating of copper with an electrostatic spray gun at 100 kV? Um, I'm glad we have that question. I don't know the answer to that question, but I have a colleague uh, that works here uh, in uh, the same plant that I'll pass that question on, and hopefully we can get a good answer. All righty. Here's another one for you. Are there any environmental issues caused by fumes from MNN type 418 uh, should that product break down due to overheating? So um, not sure exactly how to answer that question. Um, the uh, laminates like NMN, whether it's with 418 or just the normal Nomex papers, are, are glued together in most cases with adhesives and there are a number of different types of adhesives that are used in these type of laminates um, a whole di 
a whole number of family classes, polyurethanes, polyesters, a whole bunch of different type of uh, adhesives. And it would be likely that the in uh, that example that that adhesive might be the weak link. That would be the, the um, one of the degradation products. The other thing that can happen at elevated temperatures is the polyester film itself can break down and it will cause some degradation products. Um, but those temperatures usually need to be fairly extreme for that to happen. Thank you, Roger. Here's a question. Is, does DuPont make any oil application insulation? Can we use type 418 for oil immersed transformers? So um, classically, either type 410 or type 414 uh, papers are used in uh, liquid immersed transformers. Uh, there, I believe, has been some use of 418. The concern there would be is that the uh, mica uh, platelets that are used as part of the 418 paper are not as tightly bound as might be necessary in that application. And they could come loose and then be floating in the liquid uh, stream, which could cause a problem. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend the use of 418 in a liquid-filled application. That would be something we'd want to have more uh, study and investigation with the specific uh, manufacturer to make sure it was OK. Uh, and continuing along the type 418 questioning, what is the 418 V mil approximately? The 418 volts per mil. Mm -hmm. OK, so um, that's again on our technical data sheet. Uh, they're in the range of uh, 1,000 volts per mil, uh, so somewhat higher than the, uh, the dielectric strength of the type 410 material. Um, they're, because of the mica content, they're uh, around 50% mica content. They're not as strong mechanically as the, uh, the type 410 papers. Thank you, Roger. Question came up. The relative stiffness of Nomex type 410 is higher than conventional craft paper. What thickness of Nomex would be required to achieve the, sta the same stiffness inherent in 10 mil craft? And then another question to that is how does the stiffness of the laminate compare to the material that was mentioned before? Uh, gosh, I, I, I'd say the stiffness of the uh, of the um, the craft papers might be on a par. There's different types. There's a whole range of craft papers. Um, and so uh, we'd have to look at the very specific type of craft paper um, to know uh, the relative stiffness versus that paper. But I'd say they're pretty similar. Um, NMN laminates tend to be somewhat stiffer than Nomex paper of, a, of an equal thickness. Um, I would say, though, that if the application is for liquid-filled type transformers, uh, an NMN type laminate probably shouldn't be considered because um, uh, the polyester films have issues in those type of uh, applications. Thank you, Roger. Uh, some more m and type 418 questions. Is there available an MSDS sheet for that product? Um, I'm not aware of an MSDS that's been developed for that laminate. I know um, I've seen MSDSs for NMN. I wouldn't expect uh, that the MSDS for uh, a 418 containing NMN would be dramatically different. I know in our MSDS for Nomex paper, when we talk about mica, there's a very specific set of hazards and discussion related to mica materials that are added into our data sheet. So for um, if I were to be wanting an MSDS for that product, I would look at a normal MSDS for NMN and then add to it some concerns about what would be uh, contributed from the mica material. All right. Thank you, Roger. Um, someone has asked another Type 418 MNN question. What is the minimum and maximum thickness of that product? Yeah, so the 418 papers are available in thicknesses ranging from 3 mils, uh, 0.08 millimeters, up to 14 mils thick. And so laminates could be produced uh, with any of those thicknesses. 
most of the laminates that I have seen have been produced with either the 3 mil or the 5 mil uh, thick Nomex Type 418 paper. All right. Thank you, Roger. Let's see here. The next question has come up. Um, and this is... Uh, an I'm not quite sure if this question is referring to one of the solutions you gave in the example, but the question is, was DuPont able to keep the costs the same for the improved solution? So he must be referring to one of the case studies you presented. Uh, you know, each of the each of the stories I told were were different and unique. Um, in some cases, of course, the costs are higher. Um, in, in specific, though, the alternative is very short failures, and some sort of solution is required to solve that problem. And what we try to do is design a solution that is the most cost effective that can still meet the, the technical requirement of providing the long life that the uh, equipment manufacturer are using. Thank you. A uh, question has come in. Does the thermal limits of, the, of mylar impact the thermal capability of the Nomex laminate? And then a follow-up to that is, what is the reduction in the thermal rating of the laminate? So um, that's a very interesting question. Um, IEC has a standard 60626 that rates the NMN suitable for 180 degree applications and products like NM, which is a two-ply of Nomex and polyester film at 155. In aging of uh, materials, I described that with Nomex paper it will last 100,000 hours at um, 220C. In aging of NMN, it's very dependent on the thickness, the relative ratios of the Nomex to the polyester film. Uh, but in aging of those laminates, uh, the life is nowhere near the, as long, even at 180C. What happens, though, in those constructions is as the polyester film degrades, you're left with the Nomex component of the laminate that is relatively unaffected and provides long-term uh, thermal protection for the equipment. Thank you. Here's a question um, asks, how close, and I guess they're talking about the product attributes, is type 411 with type 418? Uh, they're nowhere near the same. Type 411 is a non-densified paper that is fairly low in density in the range of 0.3 grams per cc. It's specifically designed where you need to have bulk and uh, fill up space with something that is high temperature. It has a secondary attribute in that it's more open so it can be impregnated fairly well. Whereas type 418 is a very dense paper relative to the 411 and is about 50% mica. So it's a totally different product designed for different applications. Thank you. Here's a question for you. What is more important, the testing of the individual components or testing of complete systems? Yeah, so we look at use it doing a combination thereof because the testing of the individual components can be used as a screening mechanism to provide you input in terms of what you might expect in a complete system. But in reality, the equipment that's being manufactured has a system of materials, of, uh, of insulating papers and films, of impregnating resins, and more importantly, magnet wire. And it's really the combination of all of those working together that dictate the life of the electrical equipment. So while you can screen by looking at individual components, ultimately you need to evaluate all of the combinations of materials together. Recently, we just committed to adding a new testing capability for the electric vehicle and hybrid electric vehicle market where we have a dedicated lab we're establishing to be able to do testing of complete systems for motors for this application. And while we've been doing component testing in this area, what's very interesting to the motor manufacturers is our ability to evaluate all of the attributes, all of the materials together as a complete system. Thank you, Roger. Here's a question for you. Which product would you recommend for slot liners in rewinding AC generator stator windings in the tropical areas of the world where there is um, the effects of high humidity? 
gosh, that's can I come visit? It sounds like a good so. Um, I would think that uh, type 410 is the most common material that's used in that application. 414 is a very interesting material in that it is very impregnable and might provide some benefit in terms of uh, if the uh, encapsulating resin is then well impregnated into the sheet. But I think with many generators, you need a thicker material, and so the Type 410 may be the best choice. Uh, but if there's a specific uh, design or a question that can be provided, we can uh, talk to our motor designers that work for us and have them give us precise recommendation. Thank you. Earlier you mentioned testing for liquid-filled transformers. I thought these use just craft paper and mineral oil. So yeah, the bulk of the uh, equipment that's built that way do use uh, craft and uh, mineral oil, but there's a growing number of uh, pieces of equipment that are now using things like natural ester fluids and silicone fluids. And in many, many applications as well where there's some specialty applications like uh, transformers in high-speed trains and even some transformers for wind applications, a combination of a higher temperature fluid and something like Nomex paper is proven to be very helpful in enabling a more small, lightweight, compact design needed for those applications. A uh, question has come in. Um, how combative, how come Compatible or is uh, type 418 MNN with varnish impregnating resins? Um, I think it'd be quite compatible um, if uh, you know, just as if the the Nomex type 410 in a NMN would be compatible. The 418, even though it's denser than the 410 materials, is slightly more open than the type 410 because of the um, the way the product is made. So it would actually be equally impregnable, and uh, from a chemical compatibility, should be no different than the than the normal conventional NMN laminates. Okay. Here's another MNM type 418 question: Can that product be used for temperatures below or at freezing conditions, and at the same time, vary with a swing back up to high temperatures without material breakdown? Yeah, so Nomex is very good at, uh, at uh, very cool temperatures. We have data at temperatures down to at least liquid nitrogen. Uh, the problem is polyester films, so in an NMN laminate you might have issues. Um, it might be better with something like a discrete Nomex paper, either 410 or 418. Thank you, Roger. Well, we're going to take one more question because we're just about out of time. Uh, I think our last question is, it seems like your examples were all around using materials to address technical problems like partial discharge with more expensive materials. What if I just needed to find ways to lower costs? Well, quickly, you know, we would do the same approach. We'd look at individual materials, evaluate that, and then build up to finished systems. And then we would use that to help customers with an optimized solution. Thank you, Roger. Well, um, I really going to have to wrap up the webinar right now. Roger Wicks, Global Technical Marketing Manager at DuPont, thank you so much for spending some time with all of us today. And thank you to all of our audience members for being part of this webinar event. I do want to remind you that if you just take a few moments at the end of this webinar to fill out a survey, you'll shortly see it on the screen. We really appreciate it. And you will also be receiving an email from GlobalSpec with a link to the on-demand version of this presentation, a PDF of the PowerPoint you saw, an FAQ document, and a question and answer transcript. So thank you, everyone, for attending, and we'll talk with you soon. Have a great day.